Fourteen years ago, in 1950, an amazingly unconventional thinker astounded the scientific community with a theory that challenged many of its most deeply rooted assumptions. In a persuasive bestseller, this man presented a radical view of world history that linked research and hypotheses in such diverse disciplines as astronomy, geology, comparative religion, and archaeology. A storm of protest arose from every corner of the academic world, claiming that the theory was totally wrong. This opposition soon turned into an attempt to suppress the book and discredit the man who wrote it. The man is Emanuel Velikovsky, Russian-born doctor and psychoanalyst, student of the sciences and humanities, founder and one-time editor of the Scripta Universitatis series out of which grew the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. For the last 25 years, Dr. Velikovsky has been resident in the United States where he has continued his studies and advanced his theories. His first book was titled Worlds in Collision, and that was followed by Ages in Chaos, Earth in Upheaval, and Oedipus and Akhenaten. Dr. Velikovsky's contention is that in the memory of man, the Earth has gone through great natural paroxysms. He's founded his theory on the ancient records of man from all over the world, on archaeological evidence in the form of ancient calendars that have become strangely obsolete and on new and radical interpretations of information from astronomy, paleontology, paleomagnetism, and evolution. In addition, Dr. Velikovsky's theory has led him to re-examine prevailing views regarding the origins of religion, as well as those which form the basis of celestial mechanics. And he also calls for a realignment of the chronologies of ancient civilizations. Well, the re result of this wide-sweeping theory, as I've said, was a flood of very harsh criticism and ridicule. The scientific community was almost unanimous in rejection of his work. Jacques Barzin, Dean of Graduate Faculties at Columbia University, wrote just recently that the merits of the scientific issue do not alter the deplorable treatment Dr. Velikovsky's ideas received from the profession. The prejudging scorn and closing of ranks against the heretic showed typical guild animus. In recent years, however, evidence collected during the geophysical year and by several space probes has tended to verify several of Velikovsky's predictions. For instance, he had said in the face of strong disagreement that because of her recent birth, Venus is extremely hot, a view subsequently borne out by observations of Mariner II. He was accused of inventing an interplanetary magnetic field, but one has been detected since then by Pioneer 5. He claimed in 1950 that the ancient civilizations of Central America were much older than believed. Recently, this view too has been proved by radiocarbon dating. All in all, a score of Dr. Velikovsky's predictions have been verified, and the opposition within the scientific community has abated. New voices are being heard. For instance, that of Lloyd Motz, professor of astronomy at Columbia University, who, while he still disagrees with Velikovsky, says, his prediction should be recognized and his writing should be carefully studied and analyzed because they are the product of an extraordinary and brilliant mind and are based on some of the most concentrated and penetrating scholarship and research of our period. Here with us today on camera three to discuss his theories with Dr. Velikovsky, and his first television appearance is Eric Larrabee, an editor and writer whose articles about Dr. Velik Velikovsky were the earliest attempts to make him familiar to a wider audience, and whose latest piece in Harper's Magazine has directed attention to a re-examination of the Velikovsky theories. Dr. Velikovsky, it's uh, almost 15 years now since you first published Worlds in Collision. And in the years since, you've published three other books, uh, uh, Volume 1 of Ages and Chaos, Earth and Upheaval, Oedipus and Ignaton. And during this, uh, during this period, there has been the curious paradox that, that although the scientific academic community hasn't, hasn't by any means accepted what you have to say, that fortune has smiled on you in, in many respects in, in the sense that science itself, point by point, has 
gone uh, somewhat more in your direction, and also recently that uh, one observes the phenomenon of the younger generation in the colleges and universities being more receptive to new ideas than the older. I was, I was reminded of, of, uh, of a quote of Max Planck's, which you know as well, that in new ideas in science don't actually become accepted. What happens is that the, uh, older I the proponents of the older ideas die off and are replaced. When, when you look at some of the things that have happened, some of the ways in which uh, science has, has uh, come your way, so to speak, and this uh, much larger interest, much greater willingness to talk about your ideas in the colleges, uh, how do you feel looking back on it? Which of the developments uh, jump out to you the most? I remember you saying once that you had never, uh, never dreamed when you first were thinking what you should write about the planet Venus that in your lifetime uh, you would see something like the space probe Mariner which uh, successfully went within uh, 20,000 miles of that faraway planet. That, I, know that, uh, I know that stands out to you as one of, the, uh, one of the events of this time. What in particular led you to be so concerned with, uh, with what Mariner would find on Venus, uh, with in particular the question of Venus's heat, if I may, <laughs> may Well, you so. know, uh, Mr. Larby, that Venus is persona dramatis of my first book. In that book, I claim that there were terrestrial catastrophes caused by extraterrestrial agents in prehistoric and also historical times. And I tried to identify the agent. Well, Venus, the story of Venus as a protoplanet, occupies large part of the book. However, in the beginning of the book, for about 150 pages, I describe the events that were observed and left memory of them in so many historical and also folkloristic documents of and all civilization of the world. records. Yes, and records. Now you understand well that I had no personal means to send a marina probe. <laughs> And uh, so my hope and my prayer was that I should still have the chance in my lifetime, not only myself, but my opponents, I wish them long life, that they should be also witnesses of that probe, which uh, now two years ago, I believe it was August of 1962, was launched and uh, by December 14, I think it was 14, passed by, passed the, by the date point. Well, if, if, I may, if I may be a, a devil's advocate just momentarily, I know what many of, of your critics have said is that uh, a prediction like this is a matter of chance and that they imply that you were pulling things out of the air. Well, obviously, you could have said a great many other things about Venus. You could have said Venus has two moons or is made out of cottage cheese or something other than saying that it is hot. Uh, what, what led you in particular to say, quite contrary to, to the belief of the time, that Venus was a hot planet? Well, first I will say what I said. At the end of my book, in the very last two sections, before the section, the end, I put two claims. So the position which I selected for them in my book by itself proves the importance I gave to them. These were, first, Venus must be very hot. Must be hot. Must be very hot. Is very hot. I call the chapter Thermal Balance of Venus. And I said, Venus gives off heat. Not as usually supposed to be a planet gets so much heat from the sun and reflects so much heat in the space. It gives its own heat. Of course, if it is a body like other bodies in the solar system, of six billion years or longer, older, of course, then you wouldn't expect it would that it natural. would give still, uh, give off heat, heat. Now I said also that, that it was observed by contemporaries of those events and uh, after 
as a, an incandescent body. At the same time, still in 1959, it was calculated and accepted that the surface temperature of Venus is 17 degrees Celsius, only Which about three degrees above the temperature of the Earth. It's very similar to ours. To Earth. Now, even so-called mm, ashen light, which is shimmering of some light from the shadowed side of Venus. Venus between the Earth and the Sun has, like Moon, a shadowed side. was explained by a cover of ice. Well, of course you understand that there could be no ice as a temperature uh, which, or which in which, uh, in which uh, lead is molten. Yeah. Before Marin already, in 1961, it was found that by radio signals arriving from Venus that it is very hot, actually 600 Fahrenheit. And your, your reason for believing this was that your theory required that it be a new planet, a young planet in uh, geological astronomical time. Yes, it was and the cause of the needle heat, but also the result of the short but very stormy history of this body. Which is what you described in your book. Which I described actually not, uh, not theorized as much as tried to reconstruct from ancient sources from so many civilizations. Well, the, the reason that the, the objection that the, the scientific community has, has lavished on you, I assume, is that it is quite basic to a number of different sciences that the life of the solar system has been uneventful, uh, regular, uh, in the terms in which we exactly, see, as we see it, exactly as we see it now, for many, many hundreds of thousands of years. Well, until very recently, this was the, the accepted view that the solar system is almost in a static state for, well, uh, it was, when I started my book, it was said two billions, by now it is already nine <laughs> billion years. But uh, recently, you know, it has become, uh, it all changed. So many things were discovered, and one of them is the heat of Venus. But and let me also say that 600 degree of 1959 was one of the reasons to send the marina probe to find that it is not so. I remember in December of uh, that very year, 62, when the uh, marina probe was uh, still on, just past uh, the date point, but there was not yet the mm, final report. I heard mm, a man, a scientist from uh, Jet Propulsion Lab, who, speaking before the AAA convention in Philadelphia, made rather expressed his hope that it will be found the temperature much lower. What was found, it was still higher, not 600, but 800 degrees. Well, there was another, there was another finding of, of Mariner, which uh, has just in this past week uh, been still further confirmed, which is the question of Venus's motion. Uh, the, the recent confirmation of the retrograde motion is even more puzzling, is it not, and even more embarrassing uh, right. to the, to the uh, conventional orthodox view. Yes. I see it's not embarrassing to your point of view. No, but, uh, not at all. <laughs> not you at were all. more comfortable with not, it. Not <laughs> at all. I would say that the Marina probe surpassed all my uh, wildest dreams. It found first, it, it I would say, um, confirmed the find made before that by Pioneer 5, that the space, interplanetary space, is magnetic. Well, I was a target of much Much ridicule exactly because of this, that I invented for others that do not exist in the solar system, because I needed them to explain all these unusual events that took place in the sky, events that the Greek called Theomachy, the Battle of the Gods. I I remember you saying one time that that, uh, one description of of your work might be to uh, replace René Descartes back in, in uh, the position he deserves in 17th century science. I believe you meant by this his theory of the tourbillon, the vortices, as opposed to a Newtonian 
uh, universe Yes, at of least to space. put him back into position of a rightful contender of mm -hmm. Newtonian theory. Because very recently, actually a year before my book was published, in a book of uh, Philosopher Butterfield, I saw the sentence in that great, great uh, debate or contest, Descartes was the loser because yes. these worlds, these uh, uh, vortices that he described, these particles of matter or of ether that fill the universe, they are not there. Nobody found them, nobody discovered them. So it was an empty mm, universe, universe in which the mm, celestial bodies in complete peace and eventfully travel for eons. And the universe we see now is not that kind of place. Not at all. But then again, Mariner found not only this, it's found, it found, of course, this heat. And there is no explanation for this heat. It would be after it was already found, there would be some explanation for it. The best it was done by Kuiper an assumption that there is water vapors and carbon dioxide when it was thought 600. He 600 the best degrees. he could do with on, on this optimal condition for greenhouse effect would be 170 Fahrenheit. But well, now for 800 degrees, there is no explanation at all. Well. Actually, I have to ask you whether you know any <laughs> you astronomer you who will. has offered any, An explanation. any theory that was acceptable to the next astronomer. I think part of their reaction, again, if I may, if I may be the devil's advocate, is that the, the astronomers, although they may not have explanations for the puzzles that you forcefully put to their attention, the astronomers object, uh, at least many of them objected at the time, because they thought evidence was being brought to their field uh, from, uh, to their minds, extraneous fields such as history, uh, uh, archaeology, and the like. Uh, it, they have not been willing, at least in recent time, to accept uh, that sort of evidence as binding on, uh, on questions of astronomy. Uh, uh, I, I wonder uh, sometimes when you, when you uh, think that your first book was the one largely given over to this question of the human record, what, uh, what men said happened, uh, and this involved a, uh, a use of the, of the uh, past human material in, a, in an unusual, surprising way. What do you think would have happened if you had brought your other evidence first, if you had talked first about geology, if you had published uh, Earth in Upheaval, uh, which has a completely different kind of evidence in it. Do you think they would have been more receptive? I would not know. Um, many people mm, affirm this, that would have I started with geological and paleontological evidence, I would have probably not met the same uh, stormy opposition. But, uh, and I understand, of course, that f for astronomer to change his basic views on what he believes are mythology, old wife tales, yes. uh, biblical story, you know, the Bible is a book that we are asked to swear on it, but we are <laughs> asked also not to believe into it. <laughs> and uh, at least, uh, well, you know, of course, that I am not a fundamentalist and didn't try in any way to prove the Bible right. But on the other hand, it happened to me to go even further than fundamentalists go, because when the Bible, and actually in so many places, in Psalms, in Prophets, in, uh, in Mosaic books, spoken about mountains that melt like wax, that the sea erupts, and other things, that the fundamentalists would believe that these are metaphors. But I found that the same sentence, the same description are, are plentifully well, there is, there is available in Mexican, in Chinese, in yes, Hindu, exactly, in all exactly. the culture. And, and I didn't give any preference to the Bible. Exactly. Again, I, I, think I, this is, I think this may have been one of the elements that confused the argument these, these uh, 14, 15 years ago. Uh, the, the fact that it sounded like a fundamentalist argument, the fact that they didn't notice that you were drawing also on evidence from peoples all over the earth, from the ancient legends and records of all peoples, and the fact also that you your... You could not your have been not noticed by those who read the book. 
Well, I sometimes wonder. I'm not, I'm not uh, when, when you see some of the things that have been said about the book, you, you are sometimes led to doubt that they my have been some of my careful. Um, objectors who thought that uh, they can gain by this uh, the sympathy of uh, religious people accused me that I give or gave the same valence to biblical description as to some mythology or some legend folklore of uh, primitive peoples or peoples in, in pagan religion. Well, there is, a, there is another point involved here, which is that when this argument, when the argument over catastrophism went on in the 19th century, there were still many people who who took a catastrophist or semi-catastrophist kind of view, who did so for a mixture of theological reasons and bound themselves to the theology of that time. So that the idea has often been associated with, with a sort of semi-fundamentalist point of view. And the fact that you come to stories which are, appear to be, in quotes, uh, miraculous, and offer not a miraculous explanation, but a natural scientific explanation, uh, is not quite easily assimilated by readers who have always put it in the other context. Well, don't forget also that by now it's a hundred years since Darwin achieved his victory over the book of Genesis. Now <laughs> it is a little bit difficult to, uh, to go back and to say, well, the story is not exactly so. We have the phenomena from all places, from the bottom of the sea with ash and with nickel which is of meteoric origin and the ash that covers all the bottom of the ocean and you know geologists today claim like Professor Ewing uh, of Columbia University that it was an encounter with a terrific uh, comet that spread, yes, mm. spread this ash mm, all over mm. the world and now it's found evenly spread on the bottom mm. of the oceans. And you have now the accepted view, which was not accepted only 10 or 5 years ago, that the terrestrial axis moved, and that pale paleomagnetism proves us that terrestrial axis, that magnetic axis, and possibly like Rankin and other mm -hmm. of Manchester, claim that it, the Earth turned over. We know now from observation of Professor Dangean, director of Paris Observatory, that, that um, flares on the sun may influence the speed of rotation of the Earth, and there were sudden changes. Only very recently we read even that Jupiter was subjected to strong changes, and this also confirmed one of the latest of my points you had made. Yes. Is, isn't it uh, strikingly true that the, the scientists who are willing to talk about these disturbances, about a change in the terrestrial axis, a, terrestrial axis, a change in the, in the uh, magnetic field of the Earth, that they are willing to talk about them provided they are put very far back in history. They are willing to talk about uh, distortion of the Earth's crust provided... Well, this is a psychological uh, problem, you see. We generally don't like to know that we are traveling on a accident-prone planet. You of course understand that I, I am not a prophet of doom, <laughs> just the other way around. I believe that we are now, if the man himself will not be the cause of his destruction, we are now in a settled uh, mm, solar system for eons to come. But in the past, there were, in, in human memory, these very events that by reconstruction of which I could put all those claims, what you call predictions, that now, like Professor Bargen, Professor Motz, and other writing to science, and other claim for me, these predictions, an unusual prediction, because it was not things that could be accepted, could be uh, put into accepted uh, scheme. Venus is hot, when it's calculated, only 17, and it's 100 degrees hot. What, what well, Venus is covered by hydrocarbons, you know, Four years before the publication of my book, I approached the director of Harvard College Observatory asking that mm, spectral analysis should be performed on Venus. And he directed me to Professor Adams, director of Mount Wilson Observatory in California, in Palomar, and to Professor Wilt, still alive, at Yale. Mm -hmm. And I 
place before them, put before them, this my request. Explain that this is a crucial test. And, and understand, please, Venus is the last, last link in the theory. If there were catastrophes, and uh, in historical yeah. times, and caused yeah. by extraterrestrial yeah. agent, and the agent was a protoplanet Venus, and now I can say what Venus is like, that it is hot, that and it is and wrapped in a envelope of hydrocarbons. This and I claimed uh, on the basis of the historical record. Record, yes. yes. And I cl and I asked this to be performed, and I got the answers. This was summer '46, four years before the publication of the book. There are no hydrocarbons on Venus in writing, and I was so firm in my belief that. I did not blunder in, in the interpretation of historical sources that I put in my book. There must be an envelope of hydrocarbons. And then when in February uh, 63, two months after the marina um, passing, uh, uh, passing point, point. Yes, then we were the, the, the report was given out, and it was hydrocarbons, the dust the and gases, exactly as I claim it. Uh, the embarrassment here for science is that you are, you are seeking to unearth a natural fact by way of the humanistic evidence, which is to say you're bringing together a synthesis of different kinds of knowledge. But let this me say, also, let this me also say is this. an argument. Let me science. ask you, what is the principle of uniformity? What does he say? Principle of uniformity on which is based the theory of evolution of Darwin. Our modern scientific thought is built on the principle of uniformity, which crumbles by today. And which is, uh, what does it mean, this principle? Does it mean really that things that we do not observe today could not have happened years ago? What does it mean today? Today is this day in, in August? But if you believe It is that not. If, if we don't see today a comet, do not exist comets. If we do not see since decades by with an added eye that uh, any nova, that's there that's are no, no novas. That's exactly so the where should the camera three has appeared today at the endless fascination of the universe. The of and for of permitting uh, us to listen to their conversation on its challenge to the mind of man, our thanks to Dr. Not, Emanuel Dalkowski and Mr. Eric Larry. Until next week, this is Jim McAndrew. Goodbye for Camera 3. Emanuel Dalkowski's books, Worlds in Collision, Ages in Chaos, Earth in Upheaval, and Oedipus and Ochnaten are published by Doubleday.